practical black box kind of feel to it. So um, it, this presentation was actually a good excuse for me to learn a little more about how it works uh, behind the scenes. And so I've tried to translate that into um, a conceptual model today. Um, please jump in with any questions you have, or maybe you've used Docker, you have you know other uh, suggestions to offer. Um, my colleague Dan is with us and he has definitely used Docker at least as much as I. So Dan, please don't be shy if I get something wrong to jump in and set the record straight. Um, so what is Docker? Um, I'll start just by reading the Wikipedia um, definition. Uh, Docker is a set of platform as a service products that use OS level virtualization to deliver software and packages called containers. Um, so that's a, one of those uh, instances of techie writing that really cuts me to my core. Um, there's a lot of stuff in that sentence, but if we start to unpack it, um, I want to just focus on the word container because that's what a lot of that's what you'll hear a lot when people talk about Docker. They'll talk about Docker is is a set of is technology for containers to take software and package it with Docker is called containerizing it, um, and there's reasons for that having to do with the underlying um, system tools that Docker is based on. But in my own experience, I've I found it one of those cases where the 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 language that exists for these sort of historical reasons is can be misleading if you're not fully aware of the context. So I actually think the container metaphor is not the most clarifying when it comes to Docker. Um, so that's one thing I just kind of want to work through a little bit today at the beginning is what does it mean to talk about Docker as containers? Why would you want a container? Um, and, and one of the things that the metaphor suggests is that it's sort of this like, you know, encapsulated way of running an application on your computer, like you could just plop down the application and run it. And, and that is true, but it also kind of is perplexing because that, you know, to the average user, that seems like what you do with software anyway, right? You download the latest uh, installer package for Google Chrome and drop it on your Mac desktop and double click on it and it's running. So what is what is the what is the difference between that and a container? So that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and I'm gonna try to do it without assuming that you have a lot of experience with um, operating systems, particularly Linux, which is what Docker is really uh, kind of based on. Um, but if, if anything I say is confusing, please um, just uh, let me know. Um, so I'll start with a few slides and then we'll do kind of like a live demo. So um, here is a very simplified model of your, your or my computer. Um, so we've got, you know, the three boxes at the top, those are different applications. So let's say you're running, you know, the, br the browser and Microsoft Excel and, and you're running your Python interpreter. Um, and then the bottom layer is your hardware. And so applications all need resources and those include CPU cycles and memory and disk storage. And those resources are all provided by that bottom layer, right, by the, the hardware. Um, and in between the applications and the, hard, and the hardware is the operating system or the OS. And the OS does a lot of things, but one of them one of its most important jobs is to allocate resources to these different applications. And that's actually not as um, straightforward a process as you might imagine. So these red lines, um, I mean, they don't represent anything technically specific. They just represent different kinds of resources that these applications might need. You know, and something like Chrome uh, or Excel will use a lot of resources because they've got this graphical user interface. A Python interpreter usually will be using fewer resources, but in any case, you know you're, you're usually relying on your operating system to make sure that you know the wires don't get crossed and every every application is getting what it needs. Um, and these aren't you know determined in advance before you launch the application; they're sort of determined at runtime. So that's that's what the operating system that's its job is to say, okay, here's another 
application that's running and it needs some memory. So where's some available memory that I can give it and it needs access to the disk. Where is there space on the disk? It, it's doing all that for you right behind the scenes, usually. So usually that works great. Um, and well-built applications, you know, know how to respect each other's resources also. But sometimes things do get tricky. And this is a this is a um, one kind of instance where things get tricky. So let's uh, last last semester I talked about um, Apache Spark and PySpark and Python. So you know, so if if you weren't there for that briefly, Spark is a, a data analytics engine. So it's something you can use to process large data sets. Um, you can use Python with Spark, even though Spark isn't part of isn't written in Python. Spark actually needs Java to run, and it's running on the Java virtual machine, which is itself a pretty complicated environment. So if you if you have a PySpark project, most likely you'd have your Python ver Python interpreter and, and Spark, and then Java, the JVM, which is the Java virtual machine, and then various other Python libraries and Java libraries that allow those two things or three things really to kind of talk to each other. Um, and so you can, you know, as I talked, as I mentioned in that other demonstration, um, one of the challenges with something like Spark is that there are a lot of different environment variables that might need to be configured. So installing it can kind of be a, a um, an art on its own. Um, but let's say you've you've you know got your PySpark project up and running, and now you realize that there's a later version of Spark, like a new version of Spark out that's got some new features. But you have all this analysis or all this code you've written in Spark 2.7. And now you want to migrate that or look at migrate that, migrating that to Spark 3.1. Um, or let's say you know, you're working with a colleague and your colleague is you're doing the sort of development to the research, and your colleague is you know, building this out into something more public facing. And you know the the public facing version is going to use a different version of Spark than you've been using for your testing. So how you know how do you handle that situation on the same on the same computer? Um, because Spark 3.1, it turns out, requires a different version of Python and a different version of Java from the version from Spark 2.7. So now you've got all these sort of competing dependencies in these two versions of your project. And you know, ideally, you'd like to be able to switch back and forth between these versions as you test. Like, OK, does my code that I work, wrote in Spark 2.7, does that work in Spark 3.1? How do I have to change it? Are there features I you know, can incorporate now? Does that change the analysis, et cetera? That can easily um, lend, lend itself to a sticky situation, um, particularly when you've got these different versions of the same basic software package that you're trying to run on your machine, even if you're not trying to run them concurrently, let's say you start up Spark 2.7, PySpark, you do something, you shut it down, you, you now you want to start up PySpark with Spark 3.1. But does Spark now know which version of Python it's supposed to use? Does it know where the right Java installation is? Now you can you can untangle all this, right? It with a judicious setting of environment variables and other kinds of configurations. But sometimes that can take hours or days, and it can take a lot of trial and error. And at the end of that process, are you even going to remember which steps or even understand maybe which particular steps you took that actually untangled things as opposed to steps you tried that didn't do anything or maybe made matters worse? Could you replicate that again if you had to? Um, and what if you need to switch back and forth between these two projects relatively quickly? Um, that's the kind. Of, that's one example of the kind of situation that Docker and technologies like Docker are dissolved to, designed to help you solve. It's not the only approach, and I want to show something before we talk about what Docker looks like. I want to give you the model of something that Docker is not that would do something similar just because it's it's an interest it's a useful contrast to develop so there's something if you haven't encountered this before there's something called a virtual machine 
and this technology has been around for a long time. And you, you might very well have used a virtual machine, even if you didn't know it. Um, if you've ever, you know, spun up an Amazon AWS instance, like an EC2 instance or something, um, most likely you were using a virtual machine. Um, so what is a virtual machine? It's basically something, it's software that allows you to run another operating system inside an operating system. So it's sort of like nest, like Russian nesting dolls, right? So you could run this on your own computer, right? If I, if I wanted to put my PySpark project in a virtual machine, I could run a virtual machine on my Mac and it would run a second operating system. And that operating system could just run my PySpark project. And this provides really good um, isolation for my project because my project is only using this second operating system, right? It doesn't, it doesn't know, my project doesn't know about this first operating system and this first operating system doesn't know about my project. It only knows about this hypervisor, which is the thing that runs the virtual machine. Um, and, and again, like I said, any time you're using like cloud computing, most often it's virtual machine based because that allows the providers to host multiple different instances on the same piece of hardware. And you're logged in there and you have no way of accessing who your neighbors are or getting into their files, at least if you're not, you know, maybe if you're a really top level hacker, you could figure out a way, but most people don't you know cannot break out of the bounds of the virtual machine that they're assigned to look into somebody else's so it's very good at isolation the the problem is it's pretty resource intensive as you can imagine because you have to run a second operating system inside one you know you've already got one operating system running and now you have to run a second or a third etc um and you know for just running two versions of the same project that that is kind of overkill like you know, there has to be something in the middle there, right? Between this mess and this unnecessarily kind of nested situation. And that's where Docker comes in. So with an asterisk, and the asterisk um, is important, but with an asterisk, this is what Docker, this is a way to think about how Docker looks on your computer. So I, I have, these are two Docker containers now, and we'll, we'll talk about what a container is. But you know, one of them has my first Python PySpark project. The other has my second PySpark project. They are not running on their own operating systems. They're running in the same operating system, uh, the same space as all my other applications. And what Docker has done though, is allowed me to contain those resources within a kind of defined, um, there are different terms for this in like systems programming language, systems programming discourse, but basically they've kind of, they're kind of segregated. So they are isolated from each other, but they're not, they're not using virtual machines. Um, the asterisk is because Docker is, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, really built on Linux operating systems. It uses some tools that are native to those Linux operating systems. So if you're running Doc, Docker on a Mac or a Windows machine, as most of us might be if we're using on our laptop, the underlying architecture is a little different because Docker can't access, your, your Mac operating system doesn't have exactly those same features of the Linux operating system that Docker relies on. So, um, there's one important practical consequence of this, which I'll show you when we demo. Otherwise, I think this conceptual model is still useful, even if it's inexact, um, if you're using this on a Mac or a Windows machine, um, because it does sort of explain what we gain with Docker, which is kind of like a low overhead way of isolating projects or applications um, on, on a single computer or a single machine. Um, and you know this is useful, as I mentioned, when you've got different versions of projects. Um, a lot of developers also use it for, um, you know, containing the different parts of a single application. So we have some applications like that where each part, each each component runs in its own Docker container, and that makes installing the application as a whole a lot easier. 
um, because when when setting up each of those components, we don't have to worry about how its configuration affects the others. Um, and it makes it easier to distribute that uh, because it's very easy to install Docker containers, as we'll see. Um, there's also kind of like a there's also a, a research use case. Um, so and here's where you know I'm going to suggest kind of like an alternative analogy to the Docker as container um, analogy, which is the official one because Docker is called container container technology. But I think of it as more like providing recipes for environments. So for instance, uh, in this example where I've got two PySpark projects, each container is built on a Docker image. And we'll talk about what a Docker image is in just a sec. But a Docker image basically contains the specifications for all the different configurations and um, versions of uh, applications and other kinds of environment settings that are um, specific to that um, container. So when you, run, when you launch the container from that image, all of those settings in it, you know, it will install the software, but also all those, it'll set all those settings um, the way it's specified in the image. So if you, for instance, are a researcher and you want to make your work reproducible, you know, um, and you're doing computational research of any kind. Like a lot of people now will share their code, they'll share their data. Well, Docker actually provides you a way to share your environment as well. You know, you could package up whatever your environment is that you're doing this research in, in terms of the programming, you know, the if you're using Python and Spark, you know, you can package those things up into one of these Docker images with the exact versions that you're using and any other environment configurations you've had to set. And then someone else can make a container on their computer based on your image and have a replica of your environment. Now, there will be things that are different. Of course, you know, their hardware is still their hardware. It's not your hardware, right? They might have different memory or more CPU power, or less CPU power, or different disk space. But a lot of the other configurations um, that we often set, you know, like in an environment file, if you've ever worked with one of those, um, or in various kinds of other configuration utilities, all those can be packaged in a Docker image um, so that someone else can reproduce them exactly without following a long list of steps themselves. Uh, which does kind of raise the question, like, is Docker just a slicker way of something you could do with a bunch of shell scripts? And the answer is actually yes, but who really wants to spend their time writing all those shell scripts? So um, Docker makes this a lot more efficient. Um, and I think you see the benefit of that efficiency and how widely Docker has been taken up in, you know, in contexts from people developing application software for public use to individual research projects, you know, I, I'm sure people are using it in education settings, though I haven't like explored that, but you know, you can, I can imagine someone, right, like setting up a whole environment for a course as a Docker image and having the students run that in order to um, all sort of have the same installation and configuration when they're um, doing their homework. So, uh, I was going to jump into a live demo now to show you what this actually looks like in practice, but I'll also just pause there for a second. Does anyone have any questions about this sort of like conceptual, um, this, the conceptual aspect of things? All right, um, chime in please if you do. Um, and can everyone see my, it, it, can someone give me a thumbs up if you can see my terminal window? Okay, great. So um, this, is, this is perhaps the other, um, or, or uh, uh, this, this might be in some ways the, the highest barrier to using Docker is most of its functionality can only be accessed at the command line. So whether you're on a Windows machine or a Mac or a Linux machine, you, you sort of have to use the command line to interact with Docker. There is something called Docker Desktop for Mac and Windows. 
but it doesn't provide like the whole suite of Docker functionality as I understand it. And, and most of the time, like when you're reading the documentation, they're going to be telling you how to do stuff at the command line. So it, it does require, you know, some basic level of comfort with the command line. Um, but like I said, it actually, it makes more efficient a lot of things that people before Docker came along were doing with their own shell scripting and so forth. So in some ways it makes the command line a lot easier to use. Um, but, but it, but, you know, if you're doing, if you're treading into more, it's sort of deeper waters with Docker, you will probably encounter situations where it's helpful to understand how, how the operating system works from a command line perspective. And by command line, I mean, just typing in commands in the terminal. So this is, this is my Mac terminal. Um, I just, you know, opened this up uh, and I navigated to a particular directory in my file structure. Um, now Docker is, is, is running on my Mac at the moment. So I can actually uh, type Docker commands. Um, the, the, the asterisk I noted uh, is important here because um, on Linux systems like Ubuntu and all of its relatives, Docker generally just runs as a, what's called a daemon process in the background. So once you've installed it, it'll just kind of always be running. Um, on Mac and Windows, it's a little different. And uh, when you install Docker Desktop, it will usually, at least on my Mac, it will usually kind of like start up when I restart my computer. Um, and it'll be running up here. You can see, if you could see up at the top, there's a little like Docker icon on this top taskbar. This is the Docker Desktop menu. Now, if I quit Docker Desktop, I won't be able to run Docker commands. So that that's something to be aware of on Mac and Windows. Like if you run a Docker command on your Mac and it says like the Docker daemon isn't running, that means you have to start Docker desktop, which you could start, it's in the application list with all your other applications. So you just need to start it up again. Um, Sometimes I, I usually don't leave it running just because it does, unlike the Docker daemon on a Linux machine, the Docker desktop does have a certain amount of overhead. Um, so I, th I think it's using you know a fair amount of resources. So if I'm not actually using any Docker containers, I won't keep the Docker desktop running. Um, but you you can in theory just leave it running all the time. So how do we use Docker? Um, so it, once you've installed it, uh, you can actually immediately start uh, building and running containers. And the easiest way to do that is actually to use and um, if you can't uh, read the text, let me know. If that's not big enough, let me know, please. Um, but the, the easiest way to get started with Docker is to use a Docker image that someone else has already created. Um, and these are usually stored on something called a do on Docker Hub. And you can get them with this Docker pull command. So when using Docker, all the commands at the command line start with the word Docker, because that's basically telling the Docker daemon the Docker process or service that this is a command addressed to it. And then the rest of what you pull here are the commands that you want Docker to execute. So pull is going to look by default at Docker Hub, which is this cloud-based repository, kind of like GitHub, and look for an image with a particular name. So I'm just going to use this Jupyter PySpark notebook image. And uh, the Jupyter is the sort of name for the, like the, the, the particular project or repository on Docker Hub. And then PySpark Notebook is the name of the particular image. So kind of like GitHub, you can have like projects and then like things nested on, you know, particular, um, or you can have organizations, I should say, and then you can have projects within those organizations. So the same with, with Docker Hub. Um, so Jupyter is a large collection of like Jupyter related Docker images. And this one is a, this one in particular provides a notebook that has PySpark and Apache Spark and all its dependencies already installed. Sometimes you also see people put a colon and then something after the colon, that's called a tag. Because also like GitHub, there can be multiple versions of these images 
on Docker Hub, and um, you can specify which one you want if you want a particular version. I'm just going to let it get the latest one, so I'm that's the default behavior. So you can see there, it went by really fast, but it says uh, pulling from Jupyter PySpark notebook using default tag latest, pulling FS layer. So now what it's doing is actually downloading all these different parts of this Docker image. These are basically binary files that sort of have, you know, the software packaged up in them, as well as all these like different configuration, um, sort of like scripts that will set up these different configurations. So quick and question. the first time you, yeah. Mm -hmm. we'll see. So let's say I have the Python 3.8 on my machine, but I never had installed 3.7. Mm -hmm. Python 3.7 is in the Docker image, or is it just telling it to up to use it if it is installed? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you've installed Python 3.3.8 or whatever Python version you've installed, if you've installed a non-Dockerized version of it, Docker, and you're pulling a Docker image that uses a Python, a version of Python, it will not, once you start that container, it's not going to know about anything else on your machine. So that that's the container, the container parse part of it, right? So the Docker image um, provides all the, pro basically provides everything it needs to run whatever that particular application or project is, that particular environment. Um, I'm using environment like really broadly here. Um, so the image will have everything in it, including like the Python version it needs. So if you have a different Python version on your computer, it's not going to know about that. And it it won't bother with that and it won't conflict with that. That's kind of the beauty of Docker. Now, if you've used a different Docker image, you know, let's say an earlier Docker image that uses the same Python version, I think it may reuse other parts of other Docker images because it sort of does this to minimize redundancy. Um, but that's not usually something that would generate conflicts. You know, um, usually that works pretty silently and you don't have to worry about it. So um, I've got, I've downloaded this image. Now, the next thing I can do is actually run. So the first step is down, get your image, or if you've already got it, um, you can just run it. And to run it, you just do Docker run and then provide the name of the image. And um, it's pretty, you know, it, 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 it's a, for all the stuff that it's actually installing and configuring, it actually runs quite fast. So here, um, this is, you know, the typical output you see on your screen when you launch a Jupyter Notebook server. And here it gives you like the URL to go to. So we can try to go to that now. I'm just going to call up the browser. And we see this. So that 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 happens um, because now this this thing that's running here, this this Jupyter notebook server, is running inside the container, the Docker container that I started when I said Docker run. And the container doesn't know is you know it's segregated from the rest of my operating system, meaning that it's got its own set of processes, its own like sort of namespace as they call it. And that includes things like ports. So it's listening on port 8888 on the local host, which just means that you know I should be able to go over to my browser and point it to port 888 and connect. But the, the port 888 inside the container is in a completely different room, if you will, in the operating system from the regular port 888 that Google Chrome is looking for. So Chrome can't actually connect to this container yet because the container is completely segregated. So we actually have to pass some additional parameters to make that happen. So I'm going to stop that. And once you stop a container, um, it doesn't actually delete it. It just sort of powers down, if you will. And if you want to see what containers you have running, 
the command is docker ps. And this shows that I don't have any running right now, which is makes sense because I just stopped that one. But if I do docker ps a hyphen a, and this, this is where sort of command line stuff is coming into play. Like this is a typical way of passing a flag to a command line command or a command at the command line. The, the, the hyphen a means show all. And here's my container. And it says it exited 41 seconds ago. Um, you can give containers a name. If you don't give it a name, they kind of like come up, they just give it like a random name of like an adjective and a noun. Um, so th that's the name of this container. I could start it up again um, by doing Docker start and then giving it this name. Um, I actually don't want to do that though, because I need to I need to start a container with a different setting. And to do that, we actually have to start a new container. So um, I'm going to do what I the command I did before, Docker run Jupyter PySpark notebook. So I'm going to this is going to create a second container now. And I'll talk about how to clean up these containers in a second. Um, this is going to start a second container, but this time I'm going to add another argument here with the p hyphen p flag and that's going to map that's just i'm going to let it, i'm going to give it a port mapping and 888 colon 888 means basically take the docker container port 8888 and map it to the outside port 888 and by outside i don't mean like open to the outside world i just mean the port on my operating system outside the container so this seems like a little weird maybe, but it's the artifice that allows, um, oops, that did not work. Oh, you know why? Because the P needs to go before the name of the image. Sorry about that. All right, so there, here's our link. And now you can see this Jupyter Lab is running. This and this is running inside this container. And we can we can see what that means right over here on the left. I don't use Jupyter Lab very much. I usually use the notebook, but over here on the left is like a file browser. And so you can see this is this is what my file system looks like from inside the container. At the root directory, it's just got this one folder called work, which is empty, and this untitled notebook, which is the one that just started up by default. And I could like give this a name and save it, but you can't get from here to any of the other files on my computer. In fact, the directory I was in when I was running this Docker command from the command line was show you here this Docker GW coders directory, which has two files in it and a folder called notebooks with a notebook in it. But I can't, I can't see that from here, even though I launched that Docker container from within that directory. And that, that really is an illustration of what containers are doing. So this, this container has segregated this, not only this notebook and the notebook server behind it, but also this little sort of file structure um, from everything else on my computer. Um, so it really does give you, you can think of it as kind of like a sandbox. They use the term sandbox in a lot of development situations, right? A sandbox is kind of like an isolated environment where you can play around. So that's that's another way of thinking of what Docker gives you as a sandbox. Now, this was supposed to be a PySpark notebook. So can I import, Py, can I import PySpark? Let's just test it. Yep. And I could go on and actually run Spark commands, PySpark commands from this notebook, and it would be running a full version of Spark um, just completely within this container, this sort of segregated, um, isolated uh, entity that is this Docker container. Now, you know. Good question. Um, so if you yeah. do. If you do help modules, it'll just show the modules imported in this container then, right? 
Ah, OK. That makes sense. Yep. So it's got its own installation of Python, libraries, Java, everything. So um, I'm going to close out of this for now. And um, let me show you one other thing you could do, which is, you know, it. So if if I if I shut this container down just by hitting Control C, you know it now it's you can think of it as kind of gone into hibernation. So I can't access those files anymore while the container is down. I could start it back up again, and then the work I had saved, you know, my notebook would still be there. Um, but it's often not that useful to have everything just inside that container, right? There's often situations where we want access to some portion of what's outside the container on our computer. Like we might want access to a directory that has a lot of data files in it, or we might want to save our work to another directory where we have all the rest of our notebooks. So we can do that by adding another op starting another container and adding another option. And um, here's where you know the, the uh, commands can get a little long. Um, so just bear with me here. But I'm going to start up. I'm going to do my port mapping because we need to be able to access it. And then I'm going to use this um, dash V flag, which stands for volume. And here I'm going to type in the absolute path to a particular folder on my computer. And I probably should have put it closer to root because this is a lot to type in. Um, that I wanted to have access to. So I'm just going to give it access to that GW coders folder. And when you're giving it a volume mapping, you have to have the colon. So all of the, the ports and the volumes, they each have two sides. The first side is the thing outside the container. And the second, the the other, the right side of the colon is the thing inside the container. So um, I failed to mention this this the way this container is set up. It's got this file system that has a home and then a then this folder called Jovian. Um, I don't know what Jovian. I think it's Jovian because of Jupiter. Um, so that's where the home Jovian comes from. Um, that just is sort of in the documentation for that container. It describes like that's kind of where the root is for that, for access for that, not the root, but that's sort of the home folder for that container. So what I'm doing here is mapping my Spark GW coders folder to that home folder within the container. And I'm also going to add this flag dash dash rm. This is going to actually remove the container once I shut it down. So without RM, the containers kind of stick around in this like limbo waiting for you to start them up again. Um, with RM, they'll actually be deleted. So you don't want to do RM if you're actually saving files or data in the container. But in this case, we've set up this volume mapping, as it's called, with the V flag. So now I can save everything to this GW coders, Spark GW coders folder which is you know, in my home directory. So the container won't have any of my files in it. So I can remove it. I can safely remove it um, at shutdown because it's not going to have anything that needs to be persisted. And then finally, we just give it the name of the image. So this, this is the thing that, you know, that makes working with Docker kind of um, a little awkward is you've often got these kind of like very, you know, um, parameter heavy command line strings. Um, there is something else that we won't have time to cover today called Docker Compose that is really useful for handling these types of situations. So with Docker Compose, you can actually kind of put all this into a what's called a YAML file, uh, just a particular formatted file, just kind of structured uh, structured file. And um, with the Docker Compose utility, it can read all this configuration in from, from the uh, YAML file. So you don't have to type it in every time. But let's run this. And again, we're going to see like the same output we've seen before. But now when I go over here, 
I can actually see inside that um, GW coders folder I showed you before. Spark GW code Docker. Oh, you know what? I well, I meant to part it into Spark the Docker GW coders, but this is a different folder. So let me show you that one. Uh, sorry. This is from the Spark lesson I did, which is this actually works better. So this folder on my computer, you know, has these two coronavirus directories. I think one was just because I misspelled it. Um, you know, uh, a, a data directory that may or may not have anything in it now, um, and then a couple of notebooks as well as a text file. So now I can actually open these and. I could run these within the container. So I, I didn't, when I, when I wrote this notebook initially, I did not run it inside a container. It was just running with the, the version of Spark I'd installed on my own computer. But now I can run the same notebook inside, um, inside this container. Um, now the difference is, for instance, there, you know, one change I would have to make is like, here I'm showing the path to where the files live outside the container. And I can't do that from inside the container. So like this file path, I would have to change to relative to that. If we go back up here, uh, that home slash Jovian directory. Because that's from inside the container, from the container's point of view, that's where everything is. It's no longer from inside the container, users, D Smith, documents, code, that doesn't exist. You know, it, it, it exists outside the container, but the container can't see it. So it's sort of like a firewall. Um, and, and this is, you know, this is another really useful thing about Docker is sort of for data protection. You know, like say you're working on a project and you've got, you know, like your original data set over here. Um, and you're doing some, you want to try out some different um, ways of processing that data, but you really don't want to screw up the original data set because it took like a long time to harvest or whatever. So, you know, even if you're just doing this by yourself, you might be like, oh, you know, I'm nervous. Like, what if I, what if I accidentally point it to the wrong directory and overwrite everything that took me months to gather? Well, if you run your code inside a container, you can actually be very explicit about what the container can and can't see. And that can help solve some of those, you know, help you protect some data that you really don't want to be able to touch when you're running your code. If you just run your code inside a container and don't connect it to that data that you're trying to protect. So I could definitely demo a lot more, but we've only got about five minutes left. So let me just stop there and see if there are questions um, or any other wrap up that you wanted to do, Ryan. Um, I'll note that for, for learning more, there's lots of tutorials out there, but that a lot of people refer to the Docker documentation, which is actually pretty good. Um, you know, we, we have books on Docker available um, within uh, our O'Reilly tech book subscription. Um, but but the documentation on the Docker site is usually what I refer to when I want to know how to do something. So thanks, Dulce. That was great. Um, we did have a question in the discussion um, about how long does it take to load an image if some of the software is really big that I think like Python's pretty small, quick loading, but some other things are pretty big. Does it? become a problem at some point? Um, no, that's a good question. I mean, this this container is probably, or this image is probably pretty big um, because it's uh, it's got both Python, Spark, and Java in it. And those are, you know, Spark and Java are not insignificantly small. Um, you know, for some of the applications we, we maintain, uh, you know, uh, some of the applications have multiple images, and some of those images are like about a gigabyte a piece. Um, and the first time you launch the container from the image, the startup time will be long, you know, or longish. You know, we saw how long that took on here. Uh, but the nice thing about containers is, uh, and Docker images is, 
subsequent containers launched from that image will usually start up much more quickly because the image is sort of, uh, you know, and this is getting out of my depth. I don't fully understand how Docker images work, but, you know, when you pull that image, it's doing a lot of kind of like pre-processing and packaging of things in the right way so that when you spin up a container, it can actually do it very quickly. And on that Docker hub site that mm -hmm. you got it from, does it tell you everything that would be in the image then? Like, does it give you a list and says like, it's this version of PySpark, it's this version? Um, so often that will be with the documentation provided by the creators of the image. So for instance, I, I learned about this Jupyter PySpark um, image from this Jupyter Docker Stacks site. So th this isn't on Docker Hub, though their images are on Docker Hub, but all their documentation is on this this site here. And here, you know, you can you can figure you they document every image in pretty um, you know in a fair amount of detail. Uh, so you know they give you lots of different um, like this, for instance. So this is the base notebook, and it's going to tell you. Um, you know, what's sort of what, what all the settings are. Um, now, sometimes that's not enough, you know, so every Docker image has behind it what's called a Docker file. And, you know, when you really get into kind of, if you get into creating your own Docker images, um, you may need at some point to create your own Docker file. And the Docker file is really the recipe for the, the containers that are created from that image. So you can see this Docker file is like pretty long and it's actually based on some other Docker images. That's, that's the other, another um, benefit of Docker. It allows you to layer images on top of each other. So not every Docker image starts from like scratch, right? You know, so this one is based on this Ubuntu focal image that's a separate docker image um, and it may even use some other docker images in here right so images can be composed of other images um, but most of this is like a bunch of sort of shell commands that are used to like set up this environment and install these different uh, packages so if you really want to know what's in a docker image you can look at the docker file though if you're not you know really familiar with shell commands, um, a lot of this may not make a lot of sense. Um, but usually just to run a container from an image, you don't necessarily have to do this, uh, you know, worry about Docker files. Um, but if you want to package your own project as a Docker image, then you would uh, be creating a Docker, Docker file for it. Okay, that makes sense. Any other questions? Yeah, I can see it being really useful for research purposes. Because um, often we do have very specific versions of things that you're using. And even packages within Python can vary greatly when you go from one version to the next of it. So yeah. locking those in place can be important, especially if others are then I try to replicate. Yeah, it, and it's and it's also really handy even if you're not working with different versions, but you're just trying to get up and running with something that's fairly complicated technical stack, so to speak. Like, you know, most Python libraries are super easy to install, but you will occasionally encounter one like PySpark or some of the more advanced, you know, there are niche like machine learning libraries I've tried to help people with where it's like the actual machine learning libraries written in C or C++ and you know so installing it is more than just doing like pip install because you've got to get like make sure your C, C headers are there and all this other kind of stuff so if you if you're in that sort of situation where something seems like it's overly complicated to install finding out if there's a docker image available can also be um, a lifesaver in that situation because like this you know, I I got a PySpark notebook up and running with a connection to Spark, right? In the few minutes you saw me do it. Like I didn't have that installed in advance, right? Like that was completely from scratch. Whereas if 
you know, it took me a couple days to configure Spark with Python on my computer without using the Docker image. So um, it's also really helpful for, uh, you know, just, just the user of these packages, even if you're not necessarily working with different versions. Great. Then go ahead and turn off recording so I don't forget to. <laughs>